Okay, once again, welcome. Uh, for the record, this is a recorded session. Knut Andreas, I'll leave the word up to you. Okay, thank you, uh, Matthias, and uh, welcome to all you watching live, and also um, those of you who might be watching this uh, as a recording. Um, so I will uh, spend uh, 45 minutes, roughly, uh, describing uh, uh, my project, uh, which is about dynamic behavior of floating bridges exposed to wave excitation. I'm currently uh, um, employed as a postdoc uh, at the Department of Structural Engineering. Um, and this is also a, a continuation of my, my PhD work. Um, and this presentation is mainly uh, my PhD. So uh, here is a brief outline of, um, of the presentation today. Uh, I will start by um, providing some floating bridge history. Uh, I will state some motivation and objectives of the project. Uh, then I will present and introduce the, the case study, uh, the Bergsuffen Bridge. Uh, and then I will uh, um, go through the, some of the findings and the most important details of um, of the papers that uh, constitute uh, the PhD thesis, um, except for the last one due to uh, the time limitation. And then I will summarize with some uh, concluding remarks. So first, uh, the history. Uh, in 2000 before Christ, that's that's when uh, when the first uh, mention in literature of uh, floating bridges uh, is found. Um, and then in 480 before Christ, uh, King Xerxes of Persia used uh, boats, boats, like you see on this uh, picture, to cross the Hellespont, Hellespont uh, Strait in, in Turkey to get uh, millions of troops across. Um, and then the, the, the first uh, sort of permanent solution was uh, the Galata floating bridge in uh, Istanbul, uh, opened in 1912. Uh, this burnt uh, and was uh, or was severely damaged in a fire in '92, and was closed after this. Uh, the first Lake Washington Bridge in Seattle, in, um, in the state of um, Washington, uh, opened in '40, uh, and this was um, this was uh, damaged uh, or partially sunk uh, during construction and, uh, and refur refurbishment. So. Um, um, that didn't uh, go that well, but it was reopened in '93. Uh, Hobart Floating Bridge in Tasmania, outside of Australia, uh, was operating uh, for some years. Uh, and then you have a Kelowna Floating Bridge in uh, British Columbia in Canada. This opened in '58. Across the, you know, this is crossing the Lake Okanagan uh, there. And you have the Hood Canal, also in uh, Seattle in uh, Washington, opened in 61. This also sank in, in 79 during a winter storm. Um, and it was uh, fixed and reopened in 82. The second Lake Washington Bridge in uh, 63, um, also in, uh, in Washington again. Um, the Merara Floating Bridge in Guyana. This is this was never intended for permanent use, but it's still operating. So apparently it's it's okay, but it's a very primitive uh, structure. <laughs> and then you have the third Lake Washington floating bridge, uh, also in Seattle, opened in '89. And then finally in '92, uh, Norway stepped up its game and uh, opened the uh, the Bergsjøen bridge. Uh, and then shortly after, in '94, the Nordhordland bridge. Um, and both of these bridges are, are unique structures, which I will uh, uh, come back to. Uh, and then in Japan, Yumemai Bridge in 2000, uh, William R. Bennett, uh, that replaced the old Kelowna floating bridge in Canada. Uh, and this was uh, um, made possible uh, largely due to uh, the experience of uh, Norwegian consultant agencies uh, from the work on the Bergs and the Nordholland bridges. And then finally, the second Lake Washington Bridge was replaced in 2016. And this is basically it. So the, 
as you see, we have a very limited uh, amount of experience uh, on these kind of structures. Uh, and as I, uh, you might uh, notice, uh, we have uh, four of um, all of these bridges are located in a very small geographic area. Uh, so uh, Seattle uh, by far has the, the largest amount of, uh, of uh, project on this. Uh, and then let's let's restrict our uh, search uh, a bit. Let's uh, only consider the long span bridges. Uh, here, this is defined as above 500 meters. So then the Yumemai bridge in Japan uh, disappears. Uh, and let's uh, furthermore only consider those located in harsh marine environment. That's not on lakes and inland um, waters. Then we're uh, left with these three. And then if we finally, uh, let's let's say that we uh, require that uh, the bridges uh, does not have side mooring, then then we're left with the two Norwegian bridges. And this makes um, this makes us um, uh, kind of lucky in, uh, in Norway because we have experience on, on these kind of structures and and uh, as you will see, they are uh, once again uh, relevant. So on to the motivation and objectives. Um, as uh, all of you know, um, the coastal highway E39 has to cross deep and wide fjords. For instance, the Sogne Fjord, which is one kilometer deep and four kilometers wide, uh, roughly. And due to these constraints, floating bridges are, uh, are very uh, likely or highly uh, reasonable options. But we need to ask ourselves how well we are able to predict the dynamic behavior of floating bridges uh, because we don't have that much experience on them. And to do this, we should study existing floating bridges. And that's what this project is all about. Uh, so I defined three objectives for the PhD. Uh, the first one was to study and quantify the uncertainty of the dynamic response. Second, compare the accuracy of operational model analysis methods uh, applied on floating bridges. And then finally, contribute to, uh, to a better understanding overall uh, of the dynamic behavior of floating bridges. So then I will say something about the case uh, study, the or case study structure, the Bergsutten Bridge. So this is located in Møre og Romsdal County uh, on the west coast of uh, Norway. Um, and this is a region that's normally uh, known for harsh winds and, uh, and, uh, and waves. Uh, but the fact is that this bridge is still it's located in a, in a sort of protected uh, scenery here. So still um, its conditions are relatively cozy, um, I would say. Um, and it uh, crosses between the islands Bergsøya and Aspøya. It's uh, end supported, as I mentioned, um, and its design is based on seven lightweight concrete pontoons, uh, which support a um, um, steel truss superstructure. And you have spans between the pontoons of roughly 100 meters, uh, and in total, the flowing uh, floating uh, section is uh, 830 meters uh, long. Uh, and it's also, I think it's worth uh, pointing out the, the nice scenery you have here. So um, that's, that's why I have this video, because it deserves some screen time. And also it's arc shaped, which is an important uh, design detail. Uh, okay, so I will try to put this in this its size and, uh, and dimensions into context um, because uh, 830 meters doesn't maybe maybe doesn't tell you that much uh, you have the Eiffel Tower 300 meters uh, tall and here you have the Baltic system bridge uh, which is which I said is 830 meters in its floating section you have the Golden Gate Bridge which is uh, one of the longest spanned uh, suspension bridges, uh, also very famous. Uh, and just by looking at this, you see that this is a this is a slender and um, and significant structure. Uh, the pontoons they are roughly 
1,500 tons uh, in weight, uh, which is equivalent to three and a half international space stations. So uh, this is a this is a big structure. And then I will say something about the abutments, which is a critical part because this this bridge is, as I mentioned, end supported. That means that it has no supports uh, from cables on the side. So all the forces have to be absorbed at the abutments. And the way this is designed is that we have an actual uh, rod uh, that takes all the actual forces. Um, and this, this provides a flexible uh, support, um, making it possible for the bridge to move up and down with tidal variations and so on. And you have rubber bearings to take transversal forces. Okay. That's uh, the introductory part. Uh, I will, um, I will um, dive into the to the papers. So first, uh, paper one, and this is uh, the paper about uh, about the prediction, so the numer numerical stuff. Uh, okay. So first of all, to 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 start this. Uh, it's um, it's apparent by looking at the, at the sea surface uh, that waves they are very random um, and it's a very random phenomenon. Uh, but as Kinsman said, that uh, uh, behind this uh, chaos uh, you can find some sort of order, and this order you find by applying a stochastic framework and uh, considering this in a frequency domain uh, approach. And that's uh, that's by using spectral densities. And um, as uh, many in, uh, natural and environmental processes, um, we assume that it's Gaussian. Uh, and that means that it, its mean uh, and variance uh, fully characterizes uh, the process. Uh, and because we're considering dynamics, the mean value is zero. So then we're uh, we're stuck with the variance. And then you use spectral density or variance spectral density to describe the frequency distribution of the variance, basically. So you have this well-known frequency domain transfer function uh, that relates the frequency domain uh, displacements, uh, U, to the um, uh, forces or excitation, which is P, uh, through this H, uh, which um, describes the system. And then, by applying uh, spectral densities, you you are able to calculate the uh, spectral densities of the displacements from the spectral den spectral densities of the forces through uh, this equation. And then, to uh, to get this uh, up and running, um, <clears throat> you start off with uh, this expression, um, which describes the sur surface elevation. Uh, or the cross spectral density of the surface elevation between uh, pontoons R and S. Uh, and as you see here, you have this um, you have this uh, S eta, that's the one dimensional uh, wave spectral density that describes the distribution of the wave energy over different fre frequencies. And you have this D, uh, which is describing how the energy is distributed over different directions, um, basically. And then this exponential term uh, that relates the elevations at the different uh, positions. And then in a homogeneous wave description, which is what is assumed here, uh, the spectral density, uh, S eta, and the directional distribution, this D, they are identical everywhere. And then finally, to uh, end up at the the forces or the excitation, uh, you need um, some mathematical expression that relates uh, elevation to the forces and moments, and that's uh, what this uh, this Q, uh, which is the hydrodynamic transfer function. Uh, this is established uh, uh, using potential theory. Uh, we'll not will not go into details about that. Um, but that's um, that's the forces. Uh, and then to to um, to end up with the the response or the displacements or stresses, so we need to set up the equation of motion. Um, and this is a well-known uh, equation for um, 
engineers working with dynamics. Um, and you have the structural mass dumping and stiffness, uh, M, C, and K on the left side, and uh, total hydrodynamic action on the right hand side, pH. And then this can be decomposed into, uh, into the P, which is the wave excitation, uh, which is the forces acting on the pontoons, uh, assuming that they are fixed. And also this integral term, which is uh, the fluid structure interaction. And this is uh, here in time domain. It's uh, expressed as a convolution integral. Um, but uh, in frequency domain, this is simply mul multiplication. Um, and we end up with um, some frequency dependent uh, additions to mass and dumping, um, which is called, called added mass and added dumping. And also some restoring stiffness from this fluid structure interaction. And then we can simply rearrange our equation and and sum up the masses, this dumping and the stiffness. Um, yeah, and then we can use the frequency domain, um, the transfer establish a transfer function and use the power spectral density. So uh, this is uh, this is um, modeled in a in a slightly adjusted way in in this uh, in this work. Um, and that is that we have two substructures. We have uh, the first one, which is mainly the, the truss, uh, but it also includes the static contributions from the pontoons, meaning the restoring stiffness and the inertia of the, of the concrete of the pontoons themselves. Uh, and the second, which is uh, basically a hydrodynamic panel uh, method model, uh, which gives us the added mass and added dumping from the fluid structure interaction. And then uh, to enable a combination of these two, um, the dry mode shapes from the first substructure is used to define a new coordinate basis. And we use these coordinate bases to transform the contributions from the second substructure. And what we achieve uh, by doing this is that we reduce the number of degrees of freedom um, and also static condensation is uh, not that good uh, for dynamics and uh, um, it's it's important to note that this is not uh, a true modal transformation because uh, the matrices we end up with they are not diagonal uh, but this is a more detailed view of how the how the methodology um, is uh, I will not go into details here but simply refer to to the paper for those of you interested uh, but uh, just to give a, a, a brief overview, the, the green box, that's the first substructure. The blue box is, uh, is the second one. And then the, the orange one is, is the load model. Um, and this shows how you're able to combine um, results from dif different software um, uh, quite neatly. Okay, so then some some results from uh, from the response prediction. We assumed a one-dimensional wave spectral density of um, the, of a type called Pearson Moskowitz um, with one parameter, and this uh, parameter is the significant wave height, which is uh, defined as the mean of the highest third of the waves. Um, for those who are able able to get a picture of what that uh, implies. Um, and as you see in this plot, uh, sh showing different uh, spectral densities for different significant wave heights, um, you see that this affects the peak frequency as well, which is an important uh, factor for dynamic problems. And then uh, the directional distribution, this is D. Um, this was uh, simply defined uh, using the equation on the right hand side there. Uh, and you see it's plotted for three different uh, values of s, uh, which is uh, denoted the spreading parameter. Um, and you see how uh, a larger value of the spreading parameter uh, really focuses the energy of the waves uh, on, a, on a narrower band of, uh, of uh, angles. Here you see some results uh, from the predictions. Um, on the left-hand side there, you see the, uh, 
standard deviation of uh, some displacement um, uh, quantities uh, of pontoons four and six uh, as the significant wave height changes. Um, and you see that for all the uh, sizes, um, the standard deviation is increasing for uh, increased significant wave height. Uh, but you have some um, unintuitive uh, behavior there. Like the blue curve is uh, is dropping again, or its uh, a second derivative is is negative uh, there. So what's happening happening there is that you <coughs> you are uh, changing the significant wave height, and you are uh, directly therefore also changing the peak period, as I showed uh, earlier. And then you then you excite different modes, and then you get this uh, strange behavior. And then the spreading parameter on the right hand side, uh, as you see, you don't have uh, a very big influence on the spreading parameter, basically. That's the most important pointer there. <clears throat> okay, and then um, uh, to study this, uh, this last uh, result a bit more, uh, we studied the correlations of the wave elevations. So the correlation between uh, the wave elevation at a reference location R0, uh, defined in the origin of our coordinate system, and an arbitrary or variable uh, position R, uh, is defined as follows. Um, so that's basically the integral of the spectral density, the cross-spectral density divided by the um, uh, by the auto spectral density, um, and that's that turns out to be the covariance divided by the by the variance. Um, and then um, then we studied the three different excitation cases, a short crested, a long crested, and an extremely long crested uh, C state. Um, and for all of these cases, our significant wave heights were identical at 0 0.9 meters, uh, and we changed the spreading parameter. Um, use 3, 30, and 1,000. So uh, first, uh, S equal to 3, which is the short crested uh, case. Uh, and this is um, this is what we deem as a relatively realistic uh, C-state. And uh, by, by using um, the equation on the previous slide, we end up with uh, with this uh, color map of the, of the correlations with the midpoint. And you see that you have a very limited area where you have correlated wave elevation. And when you don't have correlated wave elevation, you don't have correlated wave excitation. So the forces are not correl correlated, and uh, this is an important uh, uh, important result. Uh, and then for S equal to 3, you get this uh, sea surface. Um, oh, it's uh, beginning to uh, uh, look like something not that realistic because uh, this is this is quite uh, long crested, uh, but still you have a limited uh, uh, reach of the correlation. So you have a, a very low correlation between the wave forces at neighboring pontoons. Is uh, is what we see here. And then finally, for the unrealistically long crested uh, C states with the S equal to 1000, uh, then you get a very wide uh, band uh, of a high correlation. Um, but still, it's very narrow in the in the wave propagation direction. And also, due to the curvature of the bridge, uh, you don't get correlated excitation in all pontoons. OK, so we, uh, we saw that uh, we had low correlation in the propagation direction. Um, uh, and also uh, perpendicular to the propagation direction for realistic um, uh, spreading parameters. And then finally, some um, work was uh, I put into solving the eigenvalues of the problem because this is uh, this is useful in interpreting the, um, the behavior. Uh, and because these um, system matrices are frequency dependent, uh, the solution procedure is based on iteration. Uh, and as you see on this plot, we have large damping uh, shown on the y-axis um, for some modes as high as around 12%. Uh, 
And you also see that modes three and four, for instance, which are both uh, vertical modes, uh, they're very closely spaced in, in frequency. And that might uh, result in some um, uh, complex behavior. OK, so the main findings of this paper. Um, we saw that uh, an analysis framework was established um, uh, based on the frequency domain response prediction and an iterative eigenvalue solution. Uh, we see that the sensitivity to wave spreading is very small, um, such that we can neglect the um, cross-spectral density between excitation at different pontoons in, in realistic cases. And also we saw very high damping. Okay, so I'll move on to the second paper, which is about uh, structural monitoring. Okay, so our monitoring system consists of 14 triaxial accelerometers, um, six wave radars uh, for single point measurement of the sea surface elevation, uh, five uh, anemometers measuring the wind in, uh, in three dimensions, and uh, finally, a uh, uh, displacement sensor based on GNSS technology, uh, which is an uh, um, umbrella term for uh, all the different navigation satellite systems like G GPS, uh, Galileo, um, and GLOSNAS, this Russian system. And then all of, uh, of these sensors provide digital uh, data to the loggers, uh, which are distributed across the bridge. Um, and then all loggers are also connected to a GPS antenna. And that's to ensure that all of the loggers have a common time uh, reference, uh, such as to get uh, synchronous data. And then finally, all the data is transferred uh, wirelessly through Wi-Fi to a main logger, um, which uh, you can access remotely through the web and download the recordings. Uh, here you see um, a drawing of the monitoring system. You have, um, as I said, the 14 triaxial accelerometers, two on each of the pontoons. Mm, and that's to enable uh, the capture of torsional motion. Uh, <clears throat> and as you see here, you have wave ra radars uh, lumped in two groups uh, quite close to the center of the bridge. Uh, the reason they're not distributed is that uh, the correlation is, uh, is low and um, um, uh, and we wanted to study uh, like the local correlation of the wave field. Um, okay. So here you see some results. Uh, this uh, plot shows the wind speed um, in the in the uh, axis outwards from the center, and uh, the wind direction is shown uh, radially, uh, and it's uh, it's plotted uh, on top of a map to to get a a reference. We see that we have most wind from the coast. Uh, most most of the recordings uh, show wind from from the coast. Uh, but actually, due to the uh, specific geographic condi conditions here, uh, we see that we have more harsh amplitudes from inland, which is a bit surprising. Um, and here you see uh, a plot showing the wind speed uh, plotted against the significant wave height of pontoon 3. And, um, um, what is the assumption is that waves, they are basically generated by winds. You have some swell uh, that are not, but uh, most of the, the, the waves are generated by winds. Um, and we see that we have some variability here. Um, and we can also note that uh, we have uh, uh, the maximum re recorded 10 minute mean uh, wind speed is 18 meters per second. Um, and uh, the largest significant wave out is 0 0.9 meters. Um, and that's during, uh, I guess, this, these results were after three years of, of recording or something. Or, yeah, so that's during a significant amount of time. Um, 
and still this is the harshest conditions uh, we saw. And this um, this points out to what I said uh, in the beginning that this bridge is located in a cozy uh, terrain. And here you see a plot showing uh, the, um, the the response, the acceleration of the um, uh, of the third pontoon in the heave direction and in lateral direction. Um, and by considering the colors of these dots, um, uh, they're colored depending on um, on the wind direction and uh, lateral. Uh, wind directions, meaning winds approaching perpendicularly to the bridge, they are colored uh, blue and orange. And as we see in the plots, these um, these dots show the largest response. And, and we also see that we have a smaller variability um, in the in the heave. Uh, no, sorry, in the lateral uh, acceleration compared to the heave acceleration. Um, and uh, as you see here, I've uh, I've selected the uh, three recordings to to study more in depth. Um, then uh, these were basically picked uh, based on the fact that uh, either they're considered to be uh, like normal, uh, or yeah, as in the case for the point on three, uh, or uh, with very large uh, excitation, as in point number two. Or point number one, which is maybe the one that is uh, deviating most from the average, to see what might be causing this. Yes, so these three recordings were studied more in depth. Um, here you see the horizontal horizontal wind speed uh, over the recordings. Um, and the data is stored in 30 minute uh, segments, but the dots you see there, uh, they are 10 based on, on uh, one third of, uh, of this recording, meaning that they are 10 minute uh, periods. Um, and here you see what segment uh, of the full recording is, uh, is referring to the dot. Um, so let's see how the wind direction changes uh, throughout the recording. Uh, this might provide some information. Um, and this uh, surely gives us um, some interesting information about recording one at least, which is, uh, uh, it reveals that this is a very unsteady recording uh, and the wind direction is, uh, is changing uh, drastically uh, in the last third of the, of the recording. Um, and this, uh, because the, the wave uh, process is a very high inertia process, uh, these changes are not instantly uh, transferred. Uh, these wind changes are not instantly transferred to the waves. So that is that is uh, one possible explanation for um, some of this. But it's it's um, it's important to uh, consider these sort of uh, cases. Okay, and uh, then you have the. Um, uh, peak period of the wave excitation versus the, the lateral acceleration of pontoon three. Um, and you see that uh, you have some gray lines there, and these indicate the the natural periods of the the fundamental modes uh, of our bridge. Uh, and we see that. Um, most of the peak periods of the wave excitation, meaning most of the wave energy, is located at peak periods slower than uh, our first 10 modes, uh, meaning that they are excited to a limited extent. And this is important due to uh, multiple reasons. Uh, the first one uh, being that the fundamental modes are not that heavily excited, which uh, likely is beneficial both with, with regard to displacements and, and also strains and stresses. Uh, but furthermore, it means that um, uh, our response is driven by higher modes, and the higher modes they are more difficult to to estimate correctly in our predictions. So um, this uh, requires much more of our predictions, basically. 
Uh, and then I will say something about the performance of the of um, this displacement sensor. Um, here's the comparison between this and the accelerometer of the midmost pontoon. Uh, first, for the actual component, and you see that you have a relatively large discrepancy, but you're able to uh, find what frequencies uh, dominate the response. Uh, and then for the lateral displacements, you have a much higher uh, amplitude and you have a very good agreement uh, in that case. And finally, for the vertical uh, direction, you have relatively large displacement um, there as well. Uh, but to get a significantly worse uh, result compared to the lateral component. Um, and the reason for this is that uh, the, this GNSS technology is uh, is known for a poor uh, accuracy in the vertical direction. Okay, uh, and here you see the same comparison for X, Y, and Z uh, in time domain. Okay, so uh, the monitoring system was described in detail. Uh, we see that the wave action is dominating. Mm, we have a distinct relation between the significant wave height and the bridge response. And we also observe that most of the energy is, uh, of the wave uh, excitation is located above frequencies uh, corresponding, corresponding to the first 10 modes. And this results in smaller displacements, uh, probably smaller strains. Uh, that's not completely certain, but uh, most likely. Uh, and also higher frequencies, which uh, results in more cycles to count in fatigue assessments. Um, and uh, as I mentioned also, this, uh, this model uncertainty uh, is, uh, is likely to go up. And we see that the performance of the GNSS is acceptable for large motion situations. Okay, and then the third paper, which is about operational model analysis. Um, so in an experimental model analysis, uh, you you um, you measure the forces you put into your system. You measure measure the response that you get out, and then the the target of the model analysis is to search for or find the um, the system, which is unknown. Uh, but in practice, it's not that easy to to measure the forces, uh, or it's uh, it's impossible or expensive. Um, and then you use something called operational model analysis. And then you just assume that the input, that's just noise, white noise, and you base your entire model analysis on the outputs. And in this paper, three methods were applied. Um, but I will only present results from the one uh, performing the best, which was the covariance-driven SSI. Or stochastic subspace identification method. Um, and it's important to, to reason a bit and discuss a bit about uh, uh, the performance about, uh, of, of, uh, of this uh, method uh, when applied to a floating bridge. Um, because as we saw that we have a very high damping contributions from the hydrodynamics. Uh, and for this bridge, we have closely spaced frequencies. And also, you have a very direct environmental influence, um, which will affect your results. And this environmental influence is, is uh, also interesting to study. Um, so here you see the identified modes um, uh, compared with the predicted ones. Mm, the first row shows the from, uh, the frequencies uh, are first the mode number and then the frequencies, uh, natural frequencies of the predictions uh, using finite element uh, method and, um, and then the stochastic subspace uh, method. And you see that they have a very good agreement uh, on most of the frequencies. So this result is, is quite satisfying. Uh, we're not that uh, good on the damping ratios uh, on the next uh, column. Uh, and you, you see that, uh, particularly for mode 2, we are uh, 
we are not uh, able to get a very good result. Um, and also the Mach number, the final column, uh, the Mach number is uh, describing the, the similarity uh, of the mode shapes. Uh, this is also not that good for uh, some of the modes. But still, it's a, it's, a, it's a relatively decent result. Um, but of course, uh, what I showed you previously, that requires a lot of manual work. Uh, and we have a lot of recordings. And we want to do this on as many of the recordings as possible. Um, really get some statistics uh, out of this. Uh, and then you can optimize this, um, which is what we did. And here you see the natural frequencies of all the identified modes uh, for all the recordings uh, during the um, recording period. Um, and from this data, we're able to, uh, to show the, some, some statistical um, uh, plots like this with the, the significant wave height on the um, on the x-axis and um, and the natural frequency and damping ratios of modes one to six. Uh, so the top row there shows the natural frequencies, and you see that we have uh, a reduced scatter or reduced variability for increased uh, significant wave height. Um, and also, you see that the, the damper ratios, they are not uh, very uh, um, confident. Uh, they're not uh, identified in a confident way because you have a very uh, high variability. Um, and also, you see a tendency uh, for the damping to increase uh, for increased uh, excitation. <clears throat> Okay, um, uh, yes, I think I'll just uh, hurry on to the final paper, paper four. So this is uh, all about comparing our predictions with the measurements, um, which is uh, the most important uh, aspect, really. Okay, so in the design basis of the bridge, um, a uh, Jonsson spectrum was um, um, was defined um, to be used, and um, this is expressed as follows. And uh, you see a plot showing the serviceability and ultimate limit states uh, defined for this bridge. And then you have the directional distribution, um, which is. Uh, given as a cos n, which is equivalent to the cos 2s, as you saw previously, uh, just just by altering this uh, spreading parameter. Um, and we have used the same uh, distribution for all of the predictions you will see now, um, and also assume that the c is approaching uh, laterally to the bridge. Um, and the reasoning behind this is that uh, previous findings indicate that the sensitivity to the spreading parameter is small. So this is uh, this is probably a, a decent uh, assumption. Um, <clears throat> and this table shows the um, uh, different C states to be considered, uh, where the one year, year C state is the serviceability uh, condition, and the hundred year C state is uh, what to be used for the ultimate limit state. Mm. But you see that you have. Um, Okay, yeah, uh, so the selected recording um, uh, picked out one recording of all the recordings and um, uh, made the spectral density estimates from the, the wave um, radars, uh, then averaged those and uh, fitted the, the, this average spectral density to a Jonstop spectrum to get a smooth uh, spectral density. Uh, the wind direction here was 105 degrees, so close to perpendicular. And the wave height, 70 centimeters, uh, significant, 130 in the maximum. And uh, the corresponding maximum displacement uh, during the recording was uh, not more than uh, 17 millimeters laterally and 7 vertically. So still the bridge is not moving that much. Um, so here you see a comparison of the lateral acceleration uh, of platoons 2, 3, and 4. 
Um, the red dashed line shows the measurement, and the blue one, the prediction. And you see that we have a very good agreement there. Uh, for the vertical acceleration response, we have a decent agreement uh, because the peaks are shifted, uh, the peak amplitude differs, but we have similar shape and similar similar area. Uh, so we're not uh, totally out of the ballpark, but, but it's not very good. And then finally, the torsional acceleration, which is the final uh, response uh, size that's important to consider. Um, it's not uh, not good at all, um, but um, we don't really have a very good explanation for this. Uh, one one possible um, answer is simply that uh, amplitudes are very small, so um, the accuracy of the, of the measurement and the, the noise and all this is affecting it. So so the absolute events is not might not be that big. I'm not sure. <clears throat> okay, so as you see here, this uh, C-state, uh, for instance, the one-year C-state is given with, um, with a, um, a range of uh, periods to consider. So you need to find the most critical peak period as a, as a, as a designer. Um, and in this case, intuitively, you would choose the largest one because uh, that's the one that is closest to the most or the the lowest modes uh, to the fund fundamental modes um, but this is not given because we have a dynamic uh, system and um, it's not uh, it's not completely intuitive um, so here you see the lateral acceleration of pontoon 2 um, showing the um, the peak period on the x-axis, uh, the uh, something called the peakiness factor, describing how how sharp this uh, spectral density uh, is uh, on the y-axis, and then the uh, lateral acceleration uh, standard deviation on the set axis. And there you see that you have a, a local peak uh, around the period of uh, of this mode. Um, but still, um, yeah, and and also, um, um, well, I mean, still the the largest peak period in, in our range there is is providing or giving a, a larger uh, uh, response. Uh, so still, that's the most conservative uh, option. Um, and also, other components were less sensitive to to this. It shows how uh, how important it is to to. Uh, really consider carefully dynamic problems. Um, and then finally, uh, some work was done into linking uh, the peakiness and the peak period to the significant wave height, um, like this. Uh, and by doing this, uh, you enable um, providing one single line showing the relationship between the significant wave heights and, uh, and the response, uh, for instance, the displacement or acceleration. <clears throat> so uh, this is what you see here in this uh, uh, black dashed line. That's the fitted uh, version. Um, and this is plotted together with all the measurements, which are the red dots, and also all the predictions. So all, I mean, each uh, measurement dot is uh, is um, is also uh, predicted based on uh, on what uh, what wave conditions you had uh, for that measurement. Um, and you see that the red and blue dots they are uh, overlapping quite nicely. Um, it's not possible to identify what red dot and what blue dot is corresponding to each other, but it gives you a picture of the overall uh, fit and variability. Um, this shows the lateral response, uh, which is well predicted also in a, in a global sense. Um, and also we see that this, uh, this link uh, I did with the parameters works quite well. Um, I will just end by noting that uh, the poor or worse uh, uh, agreement we saw with the vertical and torsional response is also valid for this global assessment. But I will not show any results showing this.
So this paper showed that we had a good agreement in lateral, a decent agreement in vertical, and a poor agreement in torsional motion. Um, but overall, we're able to relatively uh, good uh, capture the, um, the behavior of the bridge. And also, we saw that we uh, we had a successful linking of uh, of the peak period and the peakiness factor to the significant wave heights. So then, finally, some concluding remarks. Um, so the first uh, objective was to study and quantify the uncertainty, and this has been addressed by uh, designing an extensive monitoring monitoring system and uh, obtaining a database of recordings by establishing a prediction framework for floating bridges um, and also an iteration framework for uh, the establishment of model parameters. Um, and finally, the uncertainties have uh, to some extent been quantified uh, by comparing measurements with predictions. And then second, uh, to compare the accuracy of operational model analysis methods on floating bridges. Uh, and these methods were uh, quite successfully applied uh, but we see large variability, uh, at least for the damping values. Um, and the covariance-driven SSI method was found most robust. And then finally, uh, uh, the, the more ambitious of the, of the objectives was to, was to contribute to a better understanding uh, of the dynamic behavior of floating bridges. Um, <clears throat> through this work, we have seen that uh, um, uh, the complex modes from non-classical damping are present both in the measurement and, and the predictions. Um, we have a very low correlation of the wave excitation, uh, meaning that the directional spreading is not important for realistic wave fields. And finally, uh, like uh, a summarizing comment, floating bridges are prone to, to highly complex uh, dynamic behavior. So, just skip this. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Knut Andreas, for, uh, for your presentation. Um, I hope that, uh, that everyone uh, enjoyed the presentation so far. And uh, I think we'll open up for questions. Yep. And yeah, I have a question. Yep. The last slide of the global statistical assessment. Yes. And uh, the x-axis is uh, significant wave height, right? Yep. Uh, but the results uh, for the different significant wave height is for different periods or the same period, peak period. Yeah, that's a that's a good uh, good question. Um, so for all the measurements, I mean, we also record uh, the peak periods, um, and then uh, when we when we conduct the predictions that is uh, characterized by the blue dots, uh, mm. then we then we retain all the parameters in the Jonsop uh, spectrum that we have uh, fitted, uh, and we use that for the prediction. So, uh, so the peak period and peakiness and all all of these Jonsop uh, parameters are also used for the prediction. Yes, yeah, so, so it means that uh, it, for different dots, the uh, peak period uh, or peakiness are different too, right? Or... Yes. Yeah. That's okay. true. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Uh, I was thinking if they are the same, then it means that the structure is uh, has nonlinear. Highly nonlinear dynamic behavior. Yeah, yeah, that's a yeah. that's a good point. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Not your chance. <clears throat> I have uh, one question. Uh, yeah. Earlier, in, uh, quite early in the presentation, you uh, said that you combined uh, results, from, results from different softwares. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's the slide there. Mm -hmm. uh, do you uh, 
do you use, have you tested it against uh, different setups so that you can say anything about <clears throat> the accuracy of the this setup compared to uh, to other setups sure. uh, how do you uh, combine the uh, say the wind loading and the wave loading so you get the the right uh, result in the in the end hmm. yeah that's um, that's uh, also a good comment um, um, Actually, there is a there is a, a vacuum in the available software uh, regarding the the prediction of uh, wind and wave induced uh, response. Um, so if you're doing, I mean, in my case here, uh, this this has been emphasizing on the wave excitation, so no winds are uh, considered here, uh, which is probably reasonable for this uh, this structure. Um, um, but we have uh, as for comparison with other uh, uh, other uh, results from other software uh, what we have uh, done is that we have compared with um, with a time domain solution uh, and that's that's a pure uh, abacus or uh, that's uh, then it's fully implemented in uh, in abacus um, and that matches uh, uh, perfectly um, But we haven't uh, uh, really done done comparisons with the other uh, off-shelf uh, uh, products. Uh, no. <clears throat> that answered your question, Matthias. Or, uh... Yeah, I think so. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and just a quick follow-up to Matthias's question: uh, What mm -hmm. what software did you use uh, for this, uh, Matthias? So uh, this. Um, this first substructure, that's um, what what is done there is that's basically an, a preprocessor uh, because it's uh, what we want is the it's mode shaped, which is uh, stiffness dumping in mass matrices of, of the system, and we used Abacus uh, for that one, and we used um, uh, DNV uh, Hydro D for the, um, the hydrodynamic uh, the panel method uh, modeling, which is the second substructure. Yes, thank you. Any more questions? Don't be shy. Uh, also, the I don't know, maybe I have uh, uh, some comment uh, about the results mm -hmm. you, you have uh, about the re result uh, presented most of them are accelerations have you uh, tried to uh, uh, say include some displacement result or because it's uh, it's measurement directly from uh, acceleration so yeah. no placement has been derived or yeah that's <clears throat> that's a uh... Mm, uh, that's a good question. Uh, I think uh, uh, the approach there has been that uh, it's very easy to, I mean, if you have predicted your displacements, you have implicitly also um, predicted your uh, accelerations. And uh, so it's, it's much easier to go from to displacements to acceleration in, in the prediction because that's... Uh, Analytic or that's numerical, uh, whereas the the process of uh, converting measured acceleration to displacement is not straightforward. Uh, so we, by doing that, we would uh, likely introduce some some errors. Um, what we have yeah. have done is uh, on the um, uh, when we assess the um, GPS sensor, yeah. then we. Then we uh, Compared the implicitly the, the the transformation from accelerations to displacement, yeah. uh, and this matches in this case. But uh, this is a high excitation case with large displacement, so we're not uh, we're not confident that this would um, work out as good for for all the recordings or in the general sense. Yeah. 
Yeah, that, that's right, because it will introduce some numerical in integration, for example, that's... Yes. Mm. Okay, uh, then I think I will just inform you that I will stop the recording now. Uh, and those of you who have to leave, uh, you are free to do so. Otherwise, you can stay around. <laughs>